Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. I saw someone was from Honduras. I don't know what time it is there, but I assume it's very late. So thank you for coming to this event. Um, this is our Data Plus Diversity event, which is uh, our series that covers a lot of different things related to diversity and data challenges, the solutions. And today we're going to highlight uh, a visionary legend in this space, we're going to highlight W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who's a civil rights writer, activist, uh, and what you'll find very quickly, uh, one of the pioneers for data visualization. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Sadeel. I will be your host today. I am very honored to be a part of the Community Equity Task Force, uh, where we help put on events like these, along with my colleagues here, who I will talk about um, throughout the day. One, uh, a couple of quick housekeeping things. If you just want to say hi, as everyone's doing, let us know where you're from. Please do that in the chat. If you have a question on the bottom of your screen, you'll have a Q&A button. Um, please use that. That's the way we will track everyone's questions and make sure that we can ask our panelists and speakers um, throughout the day. We will be recording this, uh, it will go up on our YouTube page. So if you have to leave or you have a question or wanna see something again, you'll be able to see it there. Um, really quickly, I, I wanna highlight a couple of things just so that we, we have a sense of W.B. Du Bois, but um, I will leave all of the interesting points for our first speaker who's gonna give you a lot more than that. So um, W.B. Du Bois or William Edward Burkhart Du Bois, was a well-known writer. Most of you know him as a writer, historian. Uh, he's a sociologist and civil rights activist. Uh, today happens to be his birthday. We may or may not have done that on purpose. Um, he was born 154 years ago in 1868 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, um, and grew up mostly in a somewhat um, integrated community, or at least as, as much as possible in that time. Um, he did complete his graduate work at Harvard. Most people know that, um, along with some time in Berlin. Uh, but one thing Adam um, reminded me was that he also spent time at Fisk in Nashville, uh, which was a historically black college um, at the time, which uh, I think you know gave him a better sense and experience in addition to his scholarly work at Harvard in Berlin. Um, he was a data visualization pioneer, and that's why we're talking about him today. Uh, in addition to his collection of essays, The Souls of Black Folks, he was one of the architects for some of the most sophisticated quantitative research um, that we saw, uh, particularly around race in the Black population. His data is more than 120 years old and consists of 60 different charts, uh, which lots of people will talk about uh, here in a second, and was one of the, the founders and laid the groundwork for the sociology program at Atlanta University, which was one of the first uh, African-American programs. Um, so that's a quick background. I am going to turn it over quickly to a, a scholar in this field and someone who can speak more deeply about the life and times of W.B. Du Bois. Um, that will be our first session. We will also talk about recreating some of those uh, visualizations before we look at some from the challenge. But to Adam, Adam is a uh, I would say consider a scholar, but he over he runs the Du Bois Center in UMass Amherst, um, where he is uh, spending a lot of time with di different events today, I'm sure. Um, and he speaks to different audiences through some of those events and programs and has, uh, his words, been plastering social media with different facts and figures um, around his life and legacy. Uh, he also supports the work of his contemporaries, um, there's a whole group of staff in the fellowship program there that he uh, regularly helps. He talks to the boys' life, but is also a historian of the Civil War, Emancipation, and Reconstruction. Um, before UMass, he spent some time in, in the nonprofit world in the UK um, and has an MA of American Studies from King's College in London. Um, so with that, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam to let us know about W.B. Du Bois. Uh, thank you so much, Sidel, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Adam. I'm, I'm the assistant director of the Du Bois Center at UMass Amherst. We're a, um, a unique space on campus in that we are in the library, but not, um, you know, in one particular unit. Our job is 
um, to sort of across campus become a kind of hub for everything Du Bois. And we do that beyond UMass Amherst and reach out into the community um, as well. And so, you know, we see our job as preserving uh, Du Bois' legacy because we have his papers here at UMass, um, but we also promote it and promote Du Bois not just as an important historical figure, but as an important voice um, for the present um, and something that that, you know, this the Du Bois challenge um, uh, kind of encapsulates, you know, how Du Bois' work is uh, of enormous relevance uh, to our own time because it gives us a framework, um, both a kind of philosophical framework, but also a kind of a framework of facts and figures to um, interact with the uh, with current issues. And if you don't believe me, just pick up a newspaper and you'll see any number of um, articles about manufactured controversies about critical race theory, banning books, including books of Du Bois in um, school rooms across the country. And, um, and you'll see the history being contested, the history of black people in this country and the history of um, uh, the colonialized people across the world and the history of disenfranchised people across the world. And this is history that Du Bois himself wrote about and chronicled and um, has left us, um, you know, a huge amount of information on. So I'm just going to drop into the chat our uh, website because um, you might want to visit and you can follow us on social media through um, uh, through the site and um, and perhaps even consider supporting the Du Bois Center with a with a philanthropic gift um, or with a donation because um, today is Du Bois's birthday and what better um, moment to uh, to honor um, uh, Du Bois with a gift than, than today. And, um, you know, I don't just say that because I'm trying to, uh, you know, do home improvements for the office or something. It is because it goes towards supporting um, our wide range of um, initiatives, both on and off campus, and crucially our um, fellowship program. And um, so I was going to share some slides um, with you. Um, which um, the first one is, um, you know, this is what I always uh, cite as the proof that uh, should it ever be needed that you, um, uh, that you can show to um, people who doubt that you pronounce Du Bois's name the way we're pronouncing it. Um, you might think it's Du Bois, but here you can see in his own handwriting is a guide uh, to how to pronounce his name um, the way he liked to have it pronounced. Now, we don't know why um, for sure that uh, Du Bois um, wanted his name pronounced this way as opposed to the Frenchified Du Bois, uh, which would have been the original pronunciation for sure. Um, but my suspicion is that he was claiming um, the uniqueness of the sound for himself and taking a name which has because of its French origins, inevitable associations with the fact that his ancestors were uh, enslaved people. He's taking this name that was an act of ownership and reclaiming it for himself. That's my theory. I don't know for sure, but um, uh, that's what I like to think. In any case, um, I can't go on for too long, so I'm going to give you a quick um, overview of Du Bois's life before he gets to Paris in 1900 and produces um, the groundbreaking infographics that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, he is born in, uh, in, in 1868 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. He lives an incredibly long life, dying at the age of 95 in 1963 in Accra, Ghana. His life is just a fabulous record of achievement and of significance and of um, just earth shattering importance to the intellectual world, but also to the world of activism and organizing and um, a sort of impulse towards decolonializing and, um, and, dis and, and enfranchising and emboldening people uh, across the world, specifically also uh, in, in Black America. Um, he's born William Edward Burkhart Du Bois, as Sadell mentioned, in Great Barrington, uh, which is in the Berkshires, Western Massachusetts. I see a few people in the chat saying they're from there. Um, and uh, this is his high school class. I normally dwell far longer on these slides, but I don't want to take up undue time. And you can see just here that although, um, you know, uh, Du Bois is welcomed into his high school class, uh, he's not, um, it, it's not a particularly diverse group, shall we say. Um, nevertheless, the community does band together to send him to Fisk University, where he encounters a large number of people of his own race for the first time. And this time at Fisk makes such a profound impact on his life, not least because he goes out in the summers into the communities, the poor communities living in um, the towns around, uh, towns and villages around um, uh, Nashville, Tennessee to teach 
in the summers uh, and he's he's going into black communities he's learning firsthand um, the stories of of black people living in Tennessee and this is I think a huge influence on him in terms of how he starts to think about collecting the data uh, that's going to um, inform his um, his visualization work. Um, so um, from Fisk he goes to Harvard um, and Harvard's not you know we Harvard likes to brag about uh, Du Bois being the first black man to graduate with a PhD. I like to say uh, in Du Bois's words the pleasure was all Harvard because um, they are rather uh, they treated him rather badly as it happens when he turned up. They didn't let him uh, um, go straight into the PhD program because they wouldn't accept his um, uh, his education at Fisk. And so they uh, made him redo his BA. They then also denied him access to various clubs at Harvard and also to um, the housing that was available to white students. So there's no surprise that he gets a fellowship to go to Berlin uh, to study at the University of Berlin. And that is of enormous importance as well because it's in Berlin that he gets access to the um, the types of scholarship that are going to set him apart and show um, show us now uh, the ways in which Du Bois is a kind of crucial figure in the invention of sociology. Um, from Berlin he comes back to the US and he meets his wife Nina. Um, they have uh, their first child Burkhardt uh, seen there in the middle of the photo um, and they first go to Philadelphia where Du Bois um, conducts the groundbreaking sociological study, the Philadelphia Negro, which is entirely based on data collected by Du Bois in the field. Something that you might be surprised to hear wasn't actually considered the done thing at the time. Academics just sat in libraries or in their studies and just wrote the studies from there. They didn't actually go out into the streets like Du Bois did, collecting data from over 5,000 people in Philadelphia. Um, so he's just casually invented the field of sociology and that helps him get a job at Atlanta. And I want to take us up to this point in Atlanta because it's enormously important for where the rest of Du Bois's life is going to go. Um, he's teaching, he's, he's given a position teaching history and uh, economics, I think, um, in Atlanta. And he sees himself at this point as an academic through and through, as yes, an academic who's concerned with social justice themes and as a historian who is writing histories of uh, underrepresented people, um, but nevertheless, a pure scholar, not an activist, not an organizer, not a public intellectual, but someone who is very much within the ivory tower. This is all gonna change dramatically in 1899, the year before he's going to Paris. So he's already working on the, 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 the exhibit um, at, for the Paris exposition, but, um, he has, um, he's not yet had this kind of um, moment of, of clarity uh, about what the rest of his life is going to look like. And so the two things that happen are, first of all, that um, his infant son Burkhart dies. Uh, Burkhart gets diphtheria, a disease that was more common then, of course, but uh, could also have been cured had Burkhart been given access to the best medical care. And he's denied that care on the grounds of race in the Jim Crow South. This um, is, we cannot imagine the emotional trauma for Du Bois uh, to have his son die in a, um, uh, in a way where he is in part murdered by, um, by a racist community that he is, uh, finds himself in. Um, it's, it, it's also casts a huge shadow over the Du Bois's marriage. Um, their time is, even though they have another child together, uh, Du Bois and Nina's relationship never fully recovers and she spends less and less time in the South. And in fact, when Du Bois moves back South in the 1930s, back to Atlanta, she doesn't come with him. Um, and Burkhardt Du Bois is buried in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. You can see his headstone in the Mahawi Cemetery if you, um, if you are in Great Barrington. Um, the second thing that happens in 1899, having already um, you know, experienced this colossal grief, uh, du Bois experiences another trauma, which is that he nearly witnesses the aftermath of a lynching. Um, what happens is that a man named Sam Hose is lynched in Georgia. It's a nasty story, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. Um, his body is um, burned and he is mutilated and the, um, uh, the body parts of Sam Hose are displayed in a shop window in Atlanta. Um, and so I'm gonna let Du Bois take up the story and I'm gonna turn to my uh, left here to read uh, from uh, his memoir, Dusk of Dawn, where he talks about this 
moment, and I'll explain why it's significant. Um, he says, at the very time when my studies were most successful, there cut across this plan which I had as a scientist, a red ray which could not be ignored. I remember when it first, as it were, startled me to my feet. A poor Negro in central Georgia, Sam Hose, had killed his landlord's wife. I wrote out a careful and reasoned statement concerning the evident facts and started down to the Atlanta Constitution office, carrying in my pocket a letter of introduction to Joel Chandler Harris. Joel Chandler Harris, incidentally, is the author of the Uncle Remus stories. So that's a completely weird side note here. Um, I did not get there, says Du Bois. On my way, news met me. Sam Hose had been lynched and they said that his knuckles were on exhibition at a grocery store farther down on Mitchell Street, along which I was walking. I turned back to the university. I began to turn aside from my work. I did not meet Joel Chandler Harris, nor the editor of the Constitution. Two considerations there. Broken up on my work and eventually disrupted it. First, one can not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes were lynched, murdered, and starved. And secondly, there was no such a demand for scientific work of the sort that I was doing. As I confidently assumed it would be easily forthcoming, I regarded it as axiomatic that the world wanted to learn the truth. And if the truth was sort of the approximate accuracy and painstaking devotion of the world, we at least altogether. This was, of course, but a young man's idealism, not by any means false, but also never universally true. Um, so what Du Bois has said there is that this moment for him is a um, is just a um, it, 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 it has completely shocked him to his core because everything he believed to be true up till this point. Um, he realizes isn't that there is that not only um, is not is being an academic not enough. There's also not a demand for the kind of work that he's doing. That, that if he presents to um, the white world his findings and says, "Look here," they're going to disregard it because they're just um, there just is not that systemic appetite to hear the truth and to to act upon it. So Du Bois has to make the change in the world himself alongside his scholarship. And that's why he goes off to Paris in 1900. That's why um, he, um, he helps um, to found the, um, the Crisis Magazine and the NAACP. And that's why he writes The Souls of Black Folk, which is not an academic book. It is a popular work. It is intended to excite the imagination of everyone who reads it and to tell an, an indelible story of the black experience in America. And it is one of the most important works of American literature. Uh, it's one of the most beautifully written um, books in English of any period, in my opinion. Um, and, um, and it completely encapsulates this impulse that Du Bois has uh, to, um, to, to confront the world with the truth, to take his scholarship and to put it in the public, um, to, in the public sphere um, and, to, um, and to confront us uh, with um, with 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 the, what we need to know and what we need to hear, and so um, we, you know, from there, of course, Du Bois goes on to to be the editor of the Crisis Magazine for decades, to uh, become um, the author of another great piece of scholarship, Black Reconstruction, and to lead tireless ad, uh, efforts for peace and for decolonialization throughout um, the 20s, 30s, 40s, and indeed the 50s before he dies in in Ghana in 1963. But I'm going to stop there because. I'm, I'm nudging up against the, the time limit and I wanna make sure I leave room for questions. Um, but I hope that's given you a sense of where Du Bois's, um, uh, where du Bois's life was when he um, started to work on these uh, infographics and the, and, the, um, and the feeling that he had that he needed to do something different than just um, produce works of scholarship. Thank you very much. Yeah, great job, Adam. And we, you know, we're we're a little ahead. So if if there's another thing you want to show before we get into questions, um, happy to or or happy to, to start with some questions. Um. Yeah. I'm. I'm uh, uh, oh. I, yes. I'm. I'm happy to. Um. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. I also apologize for the audio issues. I see. Uh. I. I. I seem to have been having. So. Um. What I can also. Um. I can also do is I can I can reread you that Du Bois thing if you think that would be helpful um, the Du Bois passage or I can share it in the um, 
I can share it in the chat, actually. That might be the, oh, yes. Oh, I'm getting a yes, please. Okay, so yes. you'll have to, um, yeah, you'll have to just excuse the fact that Du Bois never intended for his words to be read out um, by someone with my accent, but there we go. Um, <laughs> so, um, so he, um, he says, uh, and, and do shout if, if the internet sabotages my efforts again. Um, he says, at the very time when my studies were most successful, there cut across this plan which I had as a scientist, a red ray which could not be ignored. I remember when, as it were, uh, when it first, as it were, startled me to my feet. A poor Negro in central Georgia, Sam Post, killed his landlord's wife. I wrote out a careful and reasoned statement concerning the evident facts and started down to the Atlanta Constitution office, carrying in my pocket a letter of introduction to Joel Chancellor Harris. I did not get there. On the, new, on the way news met me, Sam Hose had been lynched and they said that his knuckles were on exhibition at a grocery store farther down on Mitchell Street, along which I was walking. I turned back to the university. I began to turn aside from my work. I did not meet Joel Chandler Harris nor the editor of the Constitution. Two considerations thereafter broke in upon my work and eventually disrupted it. First, one could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes were lynched, murdered, and starved. And secondly, there was no such definite demand for scientific work of the sort that I was doing, as I had confidently assumed would be easily forthcoming. I regarded it as axiomatic that the world wanted to learn the truth, and if truth was sought with even approximate accuracy and painstaking devotion, the world would gladly support the effort. This was, of course, but a young man's idealism, not by any means false but also never universally true. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the PDF, which I'm reading from, which is available on the internet, uh, because this is in the public domain now, and pop it in the chat with the page reference. And just, I think, again, reiterate what that passage, which is, again, Du Bois writing in middle age about something that happened to him when he was much younger, but it completely encapsulates what I'm talking about. This is a, a moment of a turning point in Du Bois' life. And, and we all have them in our lives. And I think there are these, um, whether they're you know, positive events or in this case, something deeply traumatic that sort of change our trajectories and, um, and make us think differently about the work we're doing. So, um, so yeah, I'll stop there. And, um, and, and, but I will take questions if that's the right moment to do so. Yes, um, please happy to, um... If, if others have questions, please feel free to throw them uh, in the Q&A box. I, I will also try to monitor the chat, but, but please try to use the Q&A. Um, I, I think the one question, it kind of goes along with what you're saying that I had was when you, and you kind of started with this at the beginning with, with the references between Du Bois's life and some of the things that we're seeing now in terms of books being banned. And obviously there's a whole discussion on the ways that we can talk about race in, in public schools and things like that. Um, how would you, you know, and if you were to kind of conjecture, how would you think Du Bois would, you know, what would be some of his messages in this moment? How would he think about the way that things are, are going now as someone so forward in that, that process? That's a good question. And I mean, I think that, um, I think Du Bois would be thrilled that so many people are talking about him and, and reading his work um, because, you know, when people are banning your books, it means they're frightened of people reading them, right? Sure. And it shows that they're frightened of your ideas because that means your ideas are actually making some headway in the world. And when Du Bois was first publishing, for example, um, this one, The Black Reconstruction, which, um, you know, is the first book really the first major history to tell the true story of the reconstruction period from you know the the point of view that we would understand it now um you know it's 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 not really um taken much notice of but it has this outsized impact going you know into our own time because scholars now write about that period in a completely different way because in large part of Du Bois um and um it it's, it's true that um, I think Du Bois would be dismayed to see the ways in which um, a kind of undemocratic uh, white supremacist capitalist structure has been allowed to really entrench itself in America and across the world. 
and um, and he would and he would also be appalled by the militarism of our culture, um, the, the the warmongering we still see, and the militarism of our police forces, for example, which um, you know results in disproportionate deaths in the, in the black community. Um, he nevertheless, I think, would see enormous hope in the fact that access to um, uh, this, you know, education is less policed and information is less policed than it was in his own time, and that there is um, there is still an anti-communist and anti-left wing impulse in our culture, but it's much less virulent and than it was in Du Bois' time. You know, Du Bois is someone who was put on trial for his uh, left wing beliefs and his work. Yeah. So um, it is. Um, it's a con it's a confusing picture, but I think Du Bois, if he were here today, would say, "It's there in what I've written. Go back, read the Souls of Black Folk, read Black Reconstruction, read any number of speeches. One that I love, you can find on uh, on our online archive, and I'm going to pop it into the chat in a second. is is a, is a pamphlet that he produces in the early '50s called "I Take My Stand for Peace," which closes with him saying, "I want." justice, I want social medicine, I want public works, I want education for all, I want an end to war, you know, things that we still want now. It's a, it, And, um, it, you know, it, it was intended to be left to posterity. Du Bois knew after he reached a certain point that his life was so long that it spanned such an, uh, an incredible amount of time that he, he could never be understood as just the product of one era or another. And therefore he realized that in some ways his work would have to be immortal and that's not because he was an egomaniac that's because he knew that it, it to be understood properly it had to be understood in the great span of time and so Du Bois is still alive in his papers he's still alive in his writings and uh, as Lerone Bennett Jr the former e editor of Ebony magazine said in 1980 when he opened the papers uh, with a keynote speech here at UMass he said Du Bois is still on the case and he is and you can think with Du Bois and that's exciting and Du Bois always intended it to be that way um, so in some ways, I'll close by saying he is still uh, around. Sure. Yeah, I love that. I think that's that's a perfect way to frame it. Um, and, and I, I think it kind of lends itself to this this last question um, that, that we'll take here, um, which comes from A. Miller said, uh, I've been thinking deeply about decolonizing data. What does it mean? How do you accomplish it? How to center it? Um, based on what we've talked about, it seems like Du Bois may have embraced this notion. Would you agree? I mean, absolutely. Uh, it, and, and embraced it as early as, um, uh, as 1900 when he goes to Paris. And he's, uh, he's very impressed by the, um, uh, the, the world's, uh, you know, exposition there in Paris, you know, this world's fair. But he also... Um, you know, he sees the ways in which this is a highly um, problematic space, right? You know, you've got anthropological exhibits that are, um, you know, trafficking the worst kind of like social Darwinism of that time. And um, you have all these celebrations of colonialism and of uh, industry that make, that's, that's making money on the backs of the exploitation of um, labor in the colonies. Think about the Belgian Congo uh, at this time, which is using slave labor to make a fortune uh, for, uh, for, for Belgium, um, you know, or France in uh, other parts of Africa or Britain or, um, you know, the USA. Um, you know, it is all happening. It's all there at the fair and it's all there for everyone to see, except it's packaged in this propagandistic way. So what Du Bois does is he, exactly as the question says, he decolonizes colonizes the, the 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 data by in this show a show which you have to walk through to get to the rest of the american exhibit by the way is very well placed it has these groundbreaking uh, charts that show the life that um the the achievements that people who just a a, a human lifetime ago would have been either um enslaved or newly emancipated have managed to, um, you know, the achievements they managed to accumulate in the ensuing decades. Um, he surrounds these with books of patents by taken out by black people for black inventions uh, and by portraits of notable black Americans, including his sparring partner, Booker C. Washington, of course. Um, and so it's just, it's a moment that really says, we are not um, what you think we are, and um, and this and 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 here's the proof. It's in the data, um, and of course, one of the, the 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 great ways he makes it accessible is through these um, is through these incredible visualizations, which um, which make it more literal. You know, which 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 demystify 
um, data and put it in terms that um, a, a lay person can understand. So that, that I think he does this, of course, throughout his life. He's, he's, as I say, he's a public intellectual. His interest is in making information available to as many people as possible, synthesizing complicated ideas. But um, it's really, uh, really put on display here at the, um, in his data visualizations. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's a great, I, I, won't, I won't follow up too much because I think it's a great segue to, to Anthony's talk, which will, will do a lot with that data. Um, but I, I want to also say thank you, Adam. I think this is great. I think a lot of people learned a ton. You can look through the chat about all the realizations people made. In fact, um, James just said he, he shared some, some things with his spouse and she's actually on the call now. Um, so I think, I think a lot are getting a lot out of this and, and um, I, I really appreciate your, your time as well. No, it's my pleasure. And I'll, I'll drop in our, the link to our webpage again and uh, where you can find information about how to follow the center and um, thank everyone for their time today. And I look forward yeah. to the talks. Please do, please do. Um, all right, I'm gonna quickly pop this up because I, I wanna get to, to Anthony's talk, but um, Anthony is our next speaker and, and Anthony's an independent developer and designer, uh, mostly focused on data visualization, generative art, building uh, tools and combining art and code, which is, is something I think most of you, if you participate in the challenge, you're, you're very aware of this. Uh, Anthony's created several open source tools SVGo, DEC, and DECSH, uh, and DChart, and I'm going to butcher all of those to let you know how little I deal with open source tools. Um, but his projects are, include the, the things we're talking about right now. He's recreated several of Du Bois' data stories in his tools, uh, and this challenge is something that he's done a lot uh, in recent time. And I'll let um, Anthony talk a little bit more about his biography, but would love um, to hear more, Anthony, about creating data visualizations from W.E.B. Du Bois. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? I can. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for that um, intro. And thanks, Adam, for, for teeing up all of the things that we're going to be talking about today. I'm really excited on Du Bois's birthday to share my story about how I recreated 57 of the uh, 60 or so visualizations that Du Bois created for the 1900 exposition. What you see here is just a, a sort of a tapestry of all of those recreations that you see here. And just looking at them, you know, just as pieces of art, you can represent, you can see and appreciate them. But as Adam talked about, there's also a profound use of these to tell a particular story. One of the things they talk about a lot is data storytelling. And Du Bois really told the story in these visualizations. But I always like to tell the story, and, and when I'm talking about this, I talk about the people that he worked with. He didn't do it alone. He worked with you know, some of the top students at Atlanta University. And you can see sort of the representation of what they looked like back then. Um, look at these dapper gentlemen on the left, um, the debating team, and the stylish women on the steps at, a, at Atlanta University. I really like to bring back the pictures. And I think they really show and give us a view of what things were like there. This is Du Bois in 1900 um, in Paris, 32 years old. Um, as Adam mentioned, he had just suffered a loss. He had to um, go to Paris in steerage. Steerage is kind of the lowest class um, of the steamships to actually go there. But the Dapper Du Bois is there, standing there proudly, saying, I'm going to tell the world about my people. Adam talked about the venue, and I think the venue is really, really important. And that's what you see depicted in the picture on the right. Um, it was a small venue, but it was well-placed 
so that people had to go through it and see. And you could see um, the posters and the portraits and the books um, to tell that particular story. But as Adam alluded to, I really like to talk about a historical context about what was happening in America at this time. So I go back five years from 1900. For example, in the summer of 1895, in a Brooklyn park, there was a cotton plantation complete with 500 black workers reenacting slavery. This show was called Black America 1895. So you could go and see how things were like in the good old days. The year after that, 1896, the Supreme Court handed down the Plessy versus Ferguson ruling that upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation under the separate but equal doctrine. Many people like to think of this particular um, decision as the real sort of legitimization of Jim Crow. Again, as Adam alluded to, in 1897, Du Bois embarked on a study called the Philadelphia Negro, where he went door to door to really talk about and compile with charts and graphs. And many of the things that you that we're going to be talking about today, this work presaged that and sort of showed statistics and graphs to show the human condition at that time. The next year, in 1898, the duly elected people of Wilmington, North Carolina was violently overthrown. That coup occurred during the state's white Southern Democrats conspired to lead a mob of 2000 white men to overthrow the legitimately elected fusionist government. They expelled opposition black and white pol political leaders, destroyed property that had been built up since the Civil War including the black newspaper and killed an estimated 60 to 300 people. Adam alluded to lynching and specifically the lynching of Sam Hose in 1899. 20, so he wasn't the only one. 27 Georgians were lynched in 1899, including the horrific lynching of Sam Hose in April of that year which Adam said, talked about as a seminal event in Du Bois's life. He was 31 years old then. Between 1890 and 1900, Georgia averaged more than one mob killing per month. Now, all of these events are leading up to the Paris Exposition, where I think Du Bois wanted to tell again the story in three parts. We are here, we are part of America. We may have come over uh, during the slave trade, but we are entrenched and we are a important part of America. Not just that, this is who we are. This is who we have become. Recall in, in 1900 is only 35 years after emancipation. And he wanted to tell the story, this is how far we have come in that time frame. He very much had the intention of going against the social Darwinism, the doctrine that said Black people are inherently inferior. And he wanted to go against that with graphs and charts, but also books and photographs. Um, all of the visualizations that you see here are up on the Library of Congress. And I would encourage you to go there and I'll put links in the chat um, when I'm done. But there's also a rich set of photographs that come with that presentation. So going back to the venue, and again, my process was to, I saw these and I said, how can I recreate them? And I wanted to see there's a black and white photo here. But I've pasted in my recreations here just to sort of give you a visual of the pop of color and what you have might have seen 
as you were walking through the, um, the exhibition. I also wanna talk about the scale of these graphs and charts. They were poster size. Again, if you go back, <clears throat> you can see here that, you know, there are some posters that you can pull down and sort of walk through. 22 by 28 inches. So they were large. So you could immerse yourself in them. But really, I'd love to sort of walk you through a taxonomy of this collection. And as I looked through them and, and did the recreations, I sort of broken down, what, what do they kind of look like? About half of them are bar charts, and some of these bar charts are recognizable or something that you would you know, create in Tableau even today. About 16% were maps. Maps are, again, were very important. 14% of what I call blocks, the kind of abstract areas of using bold swaths of color to make the particular point. 12% or so were, had circular forms, and many people associate the Du Bois um, visualizations with the spiral, but there are others that have that. And all about 5% have those traditional graphs. And let's walk through them pretty quickly. So you can see, again, in the recreations here, the great variety of bar charts. Um, from the ones in the upper left that you see that you would might you know see today, um, the stack bars here. Um, I love this one, which is talking about data in Georgia, which actually mirrors the state of Georgia. Um, there are various forms where you've got woven things together, bar charts. This one you see this particular one, and this is actually part of our challenge that uses a bold use of colors. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as we go on. Maps were very important um, to this particular story because re recall the Paris Exposition was an international exposition. And he wanted to, to tell the world the story of what black people had gone through. And he starts with, you know, one that talks about the diaspora, the um, moving from Africa to North and South America. But then once we're here, where are we? And then zooming into the state of Georgia and talking about the Negro population um, at that time. And then showing the migration um, from North to South. Now, this one is very interesting because it, pre it predates the Great Migration, which I think scholars would say began in 1910. But you can see that there was still some migration even at that time. The two maps on the, on the bottom are showing the Black population in relation to the rest of the world. In many ways, some of the statistical things that you'll see are relating, for example, literacy. He's saying that, you know, the literacy of Black people in America is um, akin to other nations, for example. Here are the circular forms. And um, I like, these are among my favorites. As you can see, you know, I've got one behind me um, hanging up in my office. And he made very good use of these abstract forms to tell the story. For example, the one in the, the first one, city and rural population talks about, um, you, know, you know, where are we? Where do they live? And he uses that spiral form to say that there was a lot of data here. Um, even just the bold use of color talking about, you know, teachers. The, the one in the middle, which we call, I call the target chart, tells the story of um, how much property Black people had acquired over those past five years. And you can see it's sort of the, the numbers are sort of pointing into the middle. The famous uh, Du Bois spiral here is talking about a simple thing, you know, household furniture. But you can, and again, see 
the notion of how the value of the things that they had acquired had increased over the years. One of my favorite ones is this, what I call the fan chart, um, which talks about occupations and between two populations, um, the black people and um, the, the non-white, the, the whites at that time. And you can see sort of the different um, changes and how things are comparable and how some things are not. Again, I love the use of the great use of color here when we're showing big blocks of color. Um, showing the, the one on the left-hand side there, showing um, you know, the, the world going from slavery to freedom. Um, the next one is just showing what you would see as a population pyramid. Um, and again, imagine you're going through this venue and you're walking through and you see these great big pops of color and you're, imagine, you're immediately drawn in. Interestingly, there aren't that many what we would call conventional graphs, but some of them are very powerful, like the one in the middle that talks about the valuation of property. But it mixes in the kind of contemporary things that are going on, like Ku Klux Klanism and political unrest and lynching. Even the progress is going on despite these things. There's a distinct color palette in Du Bois's work. And I've tried to, again, when we've done the recreations, is to sort of identify that. One, just to show what it is, but also to help others who want to be able to uh, recreate them. You know, the tan black and brown um, was used, for example, to show skin tones. Um, the whole notion of red, green, and black, which predates the Pan-African colors by 20 years, which, which wasn't established until um, in 1920. So if you want to recreate you know, this kind of work, it's there, there's your color palette. When I did them, I used, uh, typography was very important. I used public sands and charter. But I also want to point out a new typeface that was created by a organization called Vocal Type. It's called Du Bois, um, which seeks to recreate some of the hand-drawn typography in those original visualizations. This is the book that sort of started me on my journey. W.E.B. Du Bois's Data Portraits, Visualizing Black America by Whitney Bata Baptiste and Britt Russert. You open the book and you see them laid out. And that was my challenge when I acquired this book. I said, you know what? I'd love to be able to recreate all of these. And then I set about doing that. But it's also interesting to think about, you know, then and now in terms of what we have to tell our stories. In 1900, they had pen and ink and watercolor and paper, and they used the expo to get the word out. Today, it's a little better. We are well, not better necessarily, but it's different. We have scripting, we've got digital fonts, we have PDF, we have the internet. We have venues like this one, Zoom, to be able to tell that story. Just quickly, um, just to get the proportions right and things like that, moving from you know, these analog things to digital, I had to even use you know, your traditional forms, you know, rulers and protractors to make sure I got the proportions correctly. Because my goal was to recreate them as faithfully as I could. Again, using you know, measurements to do that. I used a tool called deck shell. Um, which Dell had alluded to. Uh, this is a tool that I created to do um, visualizations and um, information graphics and, and presentations and so forth. And in fact, the presentation that you're seeing today is created in that particular tool and it has these particular functions where it works on a percent grid. 
And this is just sort of the process that I used to do that. Um, you have the color on the left, the output, and then you have the reference to make sure that you're getting things appropriately. So for example, I've got things set up now where you hit a key and it will um, interpret the code, give you your output immediately. So you can get a, a very quick um, turnaround. Just a bit of the design of them. So here's a recreation of, again, one of my favorite ones, it's also in my office, income and expenditure, which talks about um, how people spend their money. It's interesting to sort of break it down into zones. You've got the title, categories, income on the left, and then the charts on the, on the right. This is just a breakdown of the 57 plates that I created, total lines of code about 6,500, um, average lines of code of about 100. There's a breakdown of some of the code was done, was machine generated, and some of it was hand done. Um, it's important both for sharing and also for control to use source code management for this. So I had a particular directory structure. I have scripting to, to build each of the visualizations as I'm going forward and use source code control if there are bugs. And of course there's bugs where I can go back and fix them. Just some quick examples, which I'll go very, very quickly. Um, this is just showing you the data on the left, the bar chart on the right, and the deck shell code at the bottom. This is a very simple one where you just use the built-in capabilities of making a bar chart. And there you go. This one's a little, sim a little more um, involved, but it sort of shows you how you can build up the visuals from very simple um, structures, uh, you know, a circular, two lines, and some lines of text. But it's also interesting on the left, you'll see that you can capture the relationships between the objects in variables as part of deck show. Um, this is just, a, again, another example of showing, um, you know, uh, again, you lay out the proportions and then you just say, draw four lines and you've got your, um, you've got your chart and then you add your text. It's really important to take this to modern data. Somebody asked, what would Du Bois think of all of this? I think he'd be all over infographics and, and using Tableau and tools like this to get the word out. So one of the things that I've done is take modern data. For example, this is the occupation chart from 1900 looking at data from contemporary data, in this case from um, 2019. Um, it's interesting, for example, to see agriculture, fisheries, and mining um, was the predominant occupation, both for black people and white people in 1900, 62% versus 64%. But other things stand out, for example, 28% in service areas, for black people versus 5.5%. And the very thin sliver of professional work in 1900 um, versus uh, now. Then you move over to taking data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you can see how things have changed um, and how things may not have changed. Um, again, um, management, and professional are sort of the, 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 the predominant way. And then you can see the discrepancy, 31% versus 41%, for example. And again, the service, 28, 23% versus 59. But what's also interesting to me how this particular form invented in 1900 is still relevant today and very effectively shows the data. This was the um, original, for example, of the expenditures, and I moved that over to see what, what's happening again today. Also, the population. How has the population changed um, in, you know, from 1900 to 
2021. This is actually one of the ones in the Du Bois Challenge. Other people have taken up this notion of doing a Du Boisian style. Um, this is from um, data around um, for-profit um, colleges. And again, this is using the Du Boisian style with modern data. I want to close with the Du Bois challenge with my partners um, will talk about right after I'm done. And the idea of that is to take, you know, in this case, 10, uh, you know, very selected visualizations and challenge the community and say, please recreate these and post them on Twitter and talk about them. That's my time. I'm Anthony Starks. And um, I happen to, um, let me uh, post a bunch of links in the, in the chat. And I'm happy to um, talk about or answer any particular questions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, great job, Anthony. And you can you can see in the chat there there is plenty of virtual applause for your talk, and I think a lot of people got a lot a lot out of it. Um, I'll do a couple. Just looking at time, um, I would say a couple that we got that were a, a, a couple of times is can you and you you started to do this talk to the i guess the extent of how especially when you don't have technology to develop these visualizations how does that you know how long is it taking the boys how i guess how is he going about structuring these visualizations when you don't have a computer to put things in the right place yeah that's really interesting right um and in many cases you know let me just flip back to the um yeah, um, I got an appreciation for these guys, right? In many cases, they were done, so my, to answer the question, these were done by hand um, with the boys and his students. Um, and you can see sort of the hand-drawn aspects of it, right? You can see the brush strokes. You can see the limited palette that they used. In certain cases, they did use typesetting a little bit, but in many cases, all of these things were hand-drawn. And I got a large appreciation for the craft of doing that. Um, and again, you know, recreating them, I, it, it gave me that, 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 that feeling there. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. And then I guess a, a similar question on the other side of it is, you know, how would you say that range of difficulty changes for you to recreate those 57 charts, are there some, you know, that took you, you know, only a few minutes? And I guess, how does that spectrum look? Some were easy and some were hard, right? Uh, some were harder, right? Some, when you're just doing, let's say a bar graph, that's pretty simple, right? But because I wanted to recreate things exactly, you know, you may have to tweak some of the settings and things like that, right? Some of the ones are, are very difficult, you, again, using my tools, other tools might make it easier. Um, so for example, um, let me flip. In this, in this presentation, by the way, I have a full catalog of, of all of them. So, so for example, doing the, the core plus, um, my tool doesn't know anything about maps, but I was able to sort of adapt it to doing that. Those were a little difficult because I just wanted to, um, for example, the Georgia ones. Each of those county uh, boundaries were converted into um, outlines, paths, if you will. That's much easier now, for example, if you've got a GIS system or if you've got you know, sure. something like Tableau or something that will allow you to do that. But, you know, because I wanted to really understand, they had to do them by hand, right? Um, so, so that way. So some of them are simple. Some of them are, are harder. Um, it, it's interesting, for example, when you look at, um, you know, some of the, the, the line charts, the conventions in certain cases are flopped, right? 
So typically we will have, you know, time on the on the x axis and data on the y. They flipped them for some reason. I don't know why, but they did. Um, so you sort of have to, to go back and sort of adapt the tools um, for for doing that. Wow. Well. Definitely, I think, as many said, a labor of love, a lot, um, you know, a lot of different techniques have to go into building things like this and not right. just, you know, for them, but also for you to, to recreate it. So uh, we definitely appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate, you know, you taking some time to kind of walk through it. Thank you. Um, there are, if you have a second, a few more questions in the Q&A sure. um, for you to check out. Um, but I think for time, we will head over to our next presentation. Okay. Um, so I can borrow this from, from you. Take it away, guys. Thank you. All right. Um, perhaps the, the, the thing many of you have been waiting for, um, we're going to transition over to reviewing some of these visuals um, that were submitted for the, the challenge. And we're going to bring up uh, some of the leaders for the challenge, the co-founders, Alan and Sekou. Um, Alan is a VP of Communities and Impacts at Data Stories, where he empowers people, communities around the world to eliminate misinformation and create positive change using words, data, and visualizations. Um, for Tableau, he does that quite often as the advisory member of the Racial Equity Data Hub and Tableau Social Ambassador, uh, going above and beyond to drive thought-provoking conversations like these um, about data. Uh, he was actually one of the first hosts, so hopefully I am doing him justice. Sekou is a safe self excuse me, data geek uh, and computer aficionado combining scientific elements of data analysis with the narrative and properties of data visualization. Uh, he has several degrees and certifications. Um, he was one of the first people I watched uh, in Alteryx and in a lot of the different languages that he works on. And he allows that to, to you know, for him to be able to tell really interesting data stories using multiple techniques, using their different processes, um, and is always seeking to learn more um, and to improve his skill set. So, with that, I will let you all take it away and, and review some of these visuals. Well, so, now can you keep the slides up, please? Yep, um, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, if you go to the next slide. So first I wanna say Sadell's been doing a great job hosting. So Sadell, clap to you. <laughs> so um, like Anthony, oh, oh well, Sadell, you come on. <laughs> Just said you were doing good. Uh, <laughs> Trying to unmute and say thank you and then butchered everything. <laughs> no worries though. <laughs> so as Anthony mentioned, uh, him, Sekou and I, we've been running the Dubois Challenge. This is the second year we've been running it. So it's been really great. We're, it's a 10 week challenge. As you see from the chart here, we're in week three. So last week's, um, last week's visualization definitely looks challenging. Uh, this one's a little easier for those who like math, who likes maps. But one of the things about the challenge is that it's really for us, it's about like legacy, about Dubois legacy. Um, you know, for me personally, I found out about the visualizations five years ago, roughly. Um, it was awesome to see someone who looks like me who has done this work, this data work that I enjoy. And we just wanted to really, you know, celebrate the boy, continue his legacy. You know, he got canceled a lot during his career. <laughs> and also these visualizations were in the Library of Congress until about five years ago as well. So I just wanted to get it out there. We want to add him to the narrative. Um, a lot of times when people roll off names about data visualization, um, Du Bois does not come up. And so we just want to change that through this challenge, having everyone recreate it. Another thing about this year's challenge is that we did a bring your own data or BYOD. So that way we can continue his legacy by letting you know that his visualizations and his style is still relevant today. So with that, people have been bringing, you know, modern data sets to recreate um, in his style <clears throat> or create in his style. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to call out a few of the visualizations that we've seen through the challenge that, you know, kind of stood out or we just kind of took note. So the first one is by Nicole Mark. 
she um, did a BYOD visualization where because there's also a Tuskegee Airmen challenge that is happening in parallel. Uh, so she used that to she kind of combined the two challenges where she used the Tuskegee Airmen pilot data to create a, a, a what we're calling a Du Boisian style visualization. So that was definitely one of the call outs. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so this one is by Icaro Bernandez. And what I like about his is that he's using the boy visualizations to start a study because he's actually doing a few he's done he dropped another one yesterday so he's using the boy visualizations to show inequality in brazil so he here has looked at um, black households compared to white households in brazil and he's looking at the monthly income per capita and he used one of the boys more complex visualizations to do that so kudos to him um, next slide so we have Kayla. So Kayla has, she also did a similar design and I'm calling hers out. She, this was done in Tableau as well as Nicole's. Nicole's was done in Tableau and Icaro's was done using R. So Kayla's was done using Tableau and she did this trying two methods. One was she used map layers and the second one here, she was using a sunburst chart. And so she recreated um, Du Bois design here. Next slide. So Sarah Bartlett, she recreated one of Du Bois's visualizations. Um, I, you know, we've talked about this, Seku, Anthony, and I. We've talked about it in workshops that uh, Du Bois visualizations can, are what I call deceptively simple. So while this may be a line graph to most, there was a lot of work that went into recreating it. Like Anthony mentioned it, mentioned earlier, getting it into his style and making sure. So here with the placement of the graph lines and the annotations, and then using two line charts to kind of create a thicker, that thicker um, area, almost area chart between the two line charts, um, definitely took some work there. So the next slide, please. So this is the one that kind of blew us away. So we have Chimdi who actually is here today. So we were able to get him to come and talk with us for a few minutes, but he's here. And he created not only one, but 19 visualizations. Uh, so we're calling it, well, as he titles it, uh, Du Bois Portrait Gallery. So he has, he'll be walking through that visualization and showing us how he created a gallery using all of these, um, using Tableau. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Seku. He's going to go over um, some of the other cool stuff we're doing with the challenge, which is we're tracking the Twitter engagement and activity that's happening here. So we kind of know how many tweets have been going out about the challenge and who's been doing what. So I'll let Seiko explain some more. Awesome, thanks. So if you could actually let me share my screen, Sadell. Awesome. All right, so do boy challenge, uh, participant dashboard. So the problem that we saw was we wanted to see um, how many people are participating in the challenge without them having to add additional information to an additional form. So we see some of these challenges where people, you know, have a challenge out there in, in social media. And once you're done, you completed it, you posted your content, but then you have to go to say a Google form, Google sheet, somehow you have to input additional information in order for it to be tracked. So, you know, I wanted to see if there's a way that we could automate some of this information and make it much easier to streamline um, from capturing a participant. So solution. Create a way to download all Twitter data using a hashtag Dubois Challenge and Dubois Challenge 2022. So like we said, we did Dubois Challenge last year. We have uh, Dubois Challenge 2022. So as we have additional years, like how can we combine this and see what our usage is over time? Uh, so the two tools that I used was Python. So I was able to connect to an API and download the Twitter information. And then Tableau, from a Tableau public perspective, is easy for users to come in and look at this information. So I'm just going to quickly show you some of the different links um, and ways that you can do this for your own challenges or if you want to download and use your own hashtag information. I'm going to show you the Python script. So the first part in the script, and there's a link um, that I post in the Zoom and I'll also show it, but here's the script. The biggest piece here in the script is um, once you import the tables and stuff that you need, 
is to change the hashtag. So for this example, we just have do boy challenge 2022 and then you put the time um, frame that you want. So for this instance, we're using last year and I just hard coded all the way into the end of this year. Um, these are the two big components that you need um, to make it specific to what it is that you're looking for and downloading. And then from there, this just download to a CSV. Uh, you have the different information that you want to pull out. So if you want to look at the date of the tweet, uh, you have each tweet generates a unique ID, uh, the content, how many retweets that it has, how many likes does it already have, um, the actual source, and then you get the username, the location, the follower account, um, and then the actual URL as well. Um, the biggest piece with the location, if your location says A, B, C, D, E, F, that is not a Latin long actual physical location. So uh, you won't be able to populate that information on the map. So, but it will bring in whatever is um, highlighted into your Twitter account. So from there, um, knowing that we had the CSV and it was able to automate some of this stuff, created a dashboard that will allow you to look at our usage. So this is what we call a Dubois Challenge Twitter usage, um, high level metrics that we're just trying to keep track of, but overall at the highest level, um, we're just looking at the total number of tweets, You know, how many people tweets, how many tweets um, are there, um, and then how many total unique users. So we're just taking a distinct count of the usernames, um, and then what's the date with most activity? So we see here, when we launched last year, um, on that day, there was 77 tweets. So that was our biggest day that we have here. And then as I was talking about the location, uh, you have your actual activity. So we're able to see, you know, worldwide uh, what people are actually using um, and are posting with our hashtags. And then from here, you have your top 10. So, you know, of those top 10, how many people are actually verified? So we see, you know, we actually have some verified people that have participated or at least tweeted with the Dubois hashtag challenge. Um, and then we see there's some who also have a larger following who might not necessarily be verified, but still a larger following in their community. And then from here, because we have it over time, we have two different challenges. Uh, we have the ability to do a comparison uh, between the different uh, date dimensions. So this one, we're looking at where we're at last year compared to this year. If you want to break it down and look at where you're at by quarter, you can do that. Or if you want to look at it month over month, um, you had a different ability and then all the way down to the day. So you have the granularity go up and down. As I was talking about the date with most activity, we see it was 77 as well uh, we also have some filtering capabilities that we added so if you want to look at specific date range um, you could do that and then there's the actual hashtag so if you want to look at just the Dubois challenge because everybody might not necessarily put the 2022 in there they just might post Dubois challenge you have the information in there as well and if you want to look at verify so of those members um, you just have a true false filter and then if you want to look at specific handles you have that search option in here as well so all the tweets that are tied to a specific handle will then come into here and we'll filter out this information and then from here you have an actual table which gives you all the information that i showed in the python script so you have your date the twitter handle and then you have the actual content um, you have a hyperlink if you click on it and then you have the likes retweets and quotes uh, you can sort this by just a general table all you want. So, um, you know, if you want to sort it by likes or retweets or quotes, you could. Um, but the latest one that we have is Chimdi. Uh, if we click on here, we see if we just look at his stats, you know, he just posted the other day, but 260 likes as of this morning, 48 retweets, eight quotes. Um, and then here's just the information and the tweets that goes right to his tweet. And you can see all, all the information that is posted um, that is assigned to that tweet. So. This is our use, usage dashboard. Again, just trying to combine the information for this challenge, um, get all the relevant information, and then make it interactive as well. So you can go directly to the tweet um, that you see. If there's something that sticks out, you click on it and it takes you there. Uh, so from there, I'm going to pass it to Shimdi so that he can talk about his biz that he created. Awesome. Thank you so much, Seku. Thanks, everyone, who's spoken so far. And, um, you know, I really had a good time doing this and I do have a lot of appreciation, not only for art and visualization, but this specific collection by Du Bois. And so when the Du Bois challenge came around, I thought this was a great opportunity to explore using Tableau. And, you know, just like Alan and Seku had said, one of the first things you notice is these are deceptively easy. You know, like you see them getting the data points in Tableau, very straightforward, but once you start to look at those fine details that were included, like the annotations and everything that was done to really create the impact that visualization is supposed to have, you now have to find yourself doing particular tweaks and things like that. And so for that reason, you know, as I start to go through the challenge and look at all the visits, it just felt like, why don't I go a little bit beyond that 
first of all, you know, from the perspective of being able to look at that black experience as it was back in the time, you know, I haven't had that before. So it's really nice to see all the different themes, you know, education, literacy, um, ownership, population growth, et cetera, et cetera. So there's the learning components. And essentially, because, you know, we have a modern tool like Tableau and also the amazing resources by Anthony, the amount of time, you know, that was spent doing this was such that, you know, I was able to get like 20 visualizations done for the reason of, again, highlighting the great work that was done by Du Bois and also providing an opportunity for someone who is, you know, trying to learn Tableau or currently uses Tableau. What are some of the cool, you know, techniques, tweaks and hacks that were used in order to create these visualizations? Because again, you know, they're just so amazing. They're, they're visually appealing. And the idea for the gallery was actually inspired by the exhibit um, that I saw online as I was just Googling. I think North Carolina State University, they have an amazing you know, gallery, which I'll, I'll put the links in the, in the chat as well. But that really inspired me to take a similar approach to say, well, let's go ahead and recreate multiple of these, but also let's bring it all together in a way that makes it easy to navigate, easy to you know, dig into. And um, overall, I think if I could, I would have done more. But again, I think the biggest takeaway from me from this for me was that Dubois, his team, his collaborators, they were just simply way, you know, way above their time. Like I was actually really intrigued to see that level of advanced visualization in the 1900s. And here we are in 2022. And so in a time where representation wasn't really a thing, you have this team of people doing this for the Black community and really sharing their experience. So, you know, I'm happy to, to be a part of that. I think that, you know, for anyone who is sort of questioning, definitely, you know, it's a good thing to get into um, on your spare time. And overall, again, I'm just really grateful to Alan, Seku, and everyone else who was involved in this because I think it's it was really a great experience to me. And again, in honor of Black History Month, it's just a really great personal experience. So thank you for that. And um, I'll put a link to the biz in the chat as well as the inspiration. So if you definitely wanna check it out, please feel free to do so. You know, any thoughts, questions and things like that, you can find some contact information on my Tableau profile and on Twitter. Um, so again, thank you. And um, that's it for me. We have some time to quickly show it. Do we have time for you to quickly just show it? I think we do. Right? Okay. Yeah, we have this. Okay. okay. Thank I'll you just quickly share it and show how it functions then. Um, can you see my screen? Um, now we do. Okay, awesome. So this is the gallery. It, it has two pages. We basically have, this one was a Dubois style visual, visualization and then everything else from here, moving on to here. There are all recreations of his work. And so the idea is that you can essentially click on the visualization and then it takes you to look at the actual um, visual. You can hover to see the actual data points that are being represented. And um, it's been modernized a bit. So like some of the titles, you'll notice that it's not the exact same. Um, rather than using the word Negro, I changed it to black people. And um, you can also click for each of the visualizations down here, there's an opportunity to view the original. So for example, with this one, you get to see this just to kind of make the comparisons and see, okay, this is what's shown and what are the aspects that are the same? What are the aspects that are different? So you hide this one and then you can navigate through the entire gallery using the previous and next button. So for example, you go here and you can just keep going through and viewing everything. Again, you hover just like that. And if you want to go back to the main page, for example, to pick out a specific one, then you just hit the home button. And then again, so these are the main 10 that were part of the challenge. So I kept those together so that it's easy. And then on the next page, you have some other ones where I try to be as diverse as possible in terms of the different themes. But again, it just covers different aspects. Um, personally, I'll say this one here, 
this was a huge favorite of mine just because I didn't even think that I would be able to do something like this in Tableau. But again, the level of detail that Du Bois had in his, I think I was just really fascinated by it. And you'll see you know, some teeny elements are not shown because again, it was done in Tableau and some of the idea was keep it as much in Tableau as possible, where you know, like some of the lines that were connecting these bars, they're not there. But of course, you can definitely still see, you know, the different distributions across the different classes here. And so that's generally it. One more thing that I feel we can show here, I put some information. So, um, you know, of course, we have his photo here. This is a more recent portrait of him. Just a little bit of an introduction into what the this is and why I did this. And some links on, you know, Dubois himself the challenge and then the inspiration from which I got this idea. They had something similar where it's a similar gallery layout. You get to click and you have the you know summary of what it was when it came to be. You have the next. And now is this is this is really where I kind of got the idea like if we're going to do multiple Rather than posting individual visits on Tableau, why don't we just embed it together into one big viz? And that way it's just a lot easier for people to get, in, to get into. So um, feel free to check it out. And again, I think it was a really great experience. I actually, you know, surprisingly learned a lot of new techniques in Tableau, which I think, you know, if you get into them, you'll kind of find some little cool, clever tricks in there that you might even be able to use, um, you know, if you want to get into this. So. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, this is this is incredible. Thank you for for sharing that with us. Um, Alan Seiko, I don't know if you, you guys had anything else on, on this, but but that was awesome. No, that we just want to um, you know definitely highlight the ones we like and definitely highlight one of our favorites so far. So Chimdi has set the bar high. Yeah. yeah, I just want to say Shimdi's a, a magician um, with, with creating this stuff. So, <laughs> um, but no, it was great stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, and, a, and I think a fantastic way to, to close the session. So I, I appreciate um, him walking through it all, and and I think he's got the link in there as well. So definitely everyone should should check it out at some point. Um, and yeah, I think I think we're all good. I'm sorry, I'm just checking through my notes. Um, but I did want to quickly highlight a couple of other things happening um, coming up um, next. I think tomorrow, actually, the uh, Blacks and Analytics user group is having an event um, that'll talk through some careers and things like that that people may be interested in. Um, so we'll have their four panelists from Dignify, uh, Peacock. Uh, someone from BlackRock will be there and um, Energy, oh, excuse me, Encore, Electric. Uh, they'll be talking through careers and data. So if people are interested in that, definitely check that out. Um, and, and we'll throw some links for that event. Um, also wanted to highlight, I think uh, Alan mentioned the veterans. Uh, Tug is working on um, a similar challenge focused on the Tuskegee Airmen. And that's going to be taking place on Monday uh, as well. So, so feel free if you guys want to come out and, and see some of those businesses uh, as well. That'll that'll happen. Um, and and I think I think you know definitely keep tabs on this. Um, as we mentioned, this is week three of the challenge. So feel free to add to yours, add other visits, share people's visits as you see them. Um, because you know that that will make this challenge a success, and I, I think it's already been a, a tremendous success. And, and I've learned a ton, and I'm sure others have learned so much as well. Um, so I think we've got a lot of links in here as well. Uh, and I think you know, with that, I'll say you know, I'll let you guys have the rest of your afternoons, mornings, evenings, um, and just say I really appreciate you guys spending an hour and a half with us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. thanks, everybody.